You know, as a teenager, I began to form my own identity, as you probably did as well. You know, I wanted to be my own person, right? I wanted to kind of separate from my parents. You know, it's scary. I even sensed that from my, my oldest already. It's kind of like, I want to be my own guy. Um, so what that, what that means is in order to be an, an individual, I started to copy what other people were doing, right? And that, that's what it meant for me to be myself. Tongue in cheek. You know, my clothes changed. You know, my music changed. The amount of time I spent in front of the mirror changed. You know, I remember one time I went to an amusement park and, you know, I was trying out my own style, but I, I wore like the, I thought it was cool to wear black socks for some reason. Some other kids at school were doing that. So I ended up wearing dress shoes and black socks, jean shorts, and kind of like a polo shirt. It was a disaster. And I was stuck in it all day, and I, and I liked this girl, and she, I'm pretty sure, decided that she had wanted nothing to do with me after that. It was such a, a bad fashion day for me. One night I told my mom we were going to the drive-in theater. This is around when I was 16, 17 years old. But instead we went cruising. Is it still called that? Joyriding. Joyriding. Okay. We called it cruising back in my day. And so we went cruising and ended up hanging out at a friend's house. We stayed out pretty much all night. And what's funny is during that kind of adventure, I got my car stuck on the railroad tracks in the mid about 5 o'clock in the morning. I had a little Ford Festiva, probably weighed 500 pounds total. And so we got stuck on the track. And so me and my friends Aaron and Tony, we, had to, we actually had to lift it up to get it off of the tracks. Now, the, the best part of this, of this you know, bad decision by me is that the next day my mom got really angry at me because I told her I'd gone to the drive-in movie, but I didn't check to see what was on. <laughs> it was a pretty bad R-rated movie. And so my mom kind of confronts me and says, I know what you did last night. And I said, huh? She said, I know what you did last night. You went, to a, you went to a movie you shouldn't have. And so I was in the bad position, should, you know, should I lie and, and, you know, and, and say that I was at the movie and get in trouble, or should I tell the truth and get into more trouble? So that's kind of a picture of, of, of that time in my life. But thankfully, when I was almost 18, I began to allow God to arrange my life around the identity that he had already now, we all have a reputation to live up to, right? Hopefully, you've chosen yours well. You know, as a teenager, I was still figuring out who I was. You know, as we close this series, we do because of who. We're going to talk specifically about the kinds of behaviors that God has enabled us through the Holy Spirit to adopt in order to reflect well the new identity that he's given us. Turn with me to Ephesians chapter 4, verses 17 through 30, 32. We're going to cover this morning, Ephesians chapter 4. Beginning in verse 17. So I tell you this, and insist on it in the Lord, that you must no longer live as the Gentiles do in the futility of their thinking. So he's addressing their behavior. They are darkened in their understanding and separated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to the hardening of their hearts. Having lost all sensitivity, they have given themselves over to sensuality so as to indulge in every kind of impurity with a continual lust for more. So first of all, Paul starts out by saying, you know, I tell you this and insist on it. You know, Paul is their spiritual father. This is a church that he himself planted. And as such, he's compelled to address them in this way. You know, if we had more people in our lives that talked to us like this, huh? Give us some straight talk and told us what was what and what we needed to think about and what we needed to do differently, how would our lives be impacted? Would it be better or worse? And we're really uncomfortable with this kind of direction in our day and time. But Paul felt compelled by love to speak to them as a spiritual father. He says, don't live in a way that's evidence of futile thinking. You ever seen this? You ever... Had it, you know, futile thinking leads to nothing. A darkened understanding, separate from the life of God. Ignorant. And the root of it is hardened hearts, hardened toward God and God's leadership in their lives. So he's saying, don't live like this. Now, what does this kind of living look like? He talks about it specifically. He says, they indulge themselves. So if you want to know what this kind of thinking leads to, it leads to an indulgent lifestyle. You know, my father-in-law often says something that I've, I've never forgotten. He says, just because you can 
doesn't mean you should. But think about the way that we live our lives in modern times. If I want something, if I desire something, then I'm going to have it. I'm going to deny myself nothing. So when we're, when we're living in this way, we just, we're indulgent, we're indulging ourselves. But you know, indulgent lives aren't necessarily happy lives, are they? You have everything you want. Those kind of folks that you see in the news, are they happy? So if we're thinking like the world, then we're going to live indulgent lives. And when we indulge ourselves, this is a path to what Paul describes next. He says, continually desiring. You know, when someone can never be satisfied, it kind of starts leading to compulsive behavior. You know, those Lay's, Lay's potato chips, right? You can't eat just one. you got to eat more and more and more. Now, when this compulsive behavior reaches a certain degree, it's often finally classified for what it actually is. What do we call that? We call it a mental illness, right? Because that's where it starts. You know, just like Romans 12 says, if we're going to avoid conforming to the world and going with the flow, the battlefield is in the mind. So the first point is don't live like everyone else. Because if you live like everyone else, then you're going to have the consequences and the things going on in their lives that like everyone else. And so that's what Paul is challenging them to consider. You know, will this kind of living, indulgent living, continually desiring more, is that going to make us happy? You know, at the same time, though, God doesn't want to restrict your life and my life. He's not the school teacher, you know, who's wanting to take the joy out of things. God wants to teach us how to really live. There's a famous quote from C.S. Lewis. He says... It would seem that our Lord finds our desires not too strong, but too weak. We are half-hearted creatures fooling about with drink and sex and ambition when infinite joy is offered us. And I love this analogy. Like an ignorant child who wants to go on making mud pies in a slum because he cannot imagine what is meant by the offer of a holiday at the sea. So what he's saying is that we are so focused on living our way and we're like that child in the slum making mud pies when a holiday at the sea is being offered to us. And he closes by saying, we are far too easily pleased. So we're going to address that this morning. Continuing on verse 20. So he's speaking to them as a father. You, however, did not come to know Christ that way. Surely you heard of him and were taught in accordance with the truth that is in Jesus. You were taught with regard to your former way of life to put off your old self, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires to be made new in the attitude of your minds and to put on the new self created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. So God has done something incredible for us that we could not have done for ourselves. He's given us a new identity. He says, you were taught with regard to your former life. Put off your old self, which is being corrupted by deceitful desires. You know, isn't it funny? The things that we feel like we really want, that we really need, those desires, they actually lie to us. It's kind of like the old bait and switch. You know, they promise you one thing, but deliver something totally different. Isn't that that's what our experience teaches us? When you indulge yourself, this impacts your health. Right? It impacts your pocketbook. When you just can't get enough, you've got to have it. You've got to have it. It impacts your heart, your emotional state. It impacts your relationships. It impacts your reputation. It impacts your ability to be generous. When you're just living indulgently. And then eventually it impacts your freedom. Like I said, we're starting to celebrate recovery group on Tuesday nights in September. And there's a lot of people who've made choices that they felt like would free them. But in the end, it created bondage. You know, ironically, choosing not to live like everyone else is actually the pathway to peace and satisfaction. And so this morning, Paul's going to give us some principles to live by. You know, that in contrast to just going with the flow and doing what feels good, God would challenge us to live differently. And in doing so, we can find the kind of life that we really want. 
a life of peace and satisfaction. It says, be made new in the attitude of your minds. Put on the new self. Now, men, I don't know if this is something that you have ever struggled with, but I'm going to put it out there anyway. But ladies, I know, because I've seen it. Have you ever struggled to choose the right outfit? It's a big decision, right? Guys, do we struggle with this? Jack, is this a problem? I mean, my son, we have to say, Caleb, you can't wear the same outfit day after day. But have you ever struggled to choose the right outfit? You know, what, what is it that trips you up? And, 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 and ladies, correct me, but my bet, to the best of my knowledge, it's that you want to choose clothing that portrays you appropriately. Maybe portrays your mood, portrays, you know, where you're headed, what your goals are in going there. You know, sometimes we intentionally dress in a way that's uncharacteristic, right? We're going to a party or like a Halloween party. But most times we want to dress in a way that accurately reflects what we want to be known for, right? When we're choosing an outfit. So rather than indulgent folks who can never get enough, our new identity in Christ gives us an opportunity to take advantage of an entirely new wardrobe. Free. Okay? An entirely new wardrobe that was previously unavailable to us. You know, because of our sinful nature and unregenerate hearts, these clothes were out of our price range. We couldn't afford them. They had to be given to us through Christ. Before, you weren't free to change outfits, but now a new wardrobe has been made available, one that better suits how God sees you. So the big idea today is to put on your new self and to be who you already are. As if a new wardrobe has been made available to you. So this morning we're going to talk about a few articles of clothing that have now been made available to you and can be included in your repertoire. Be who you already are. Verse 25. And these are challenging, but I've grown as I've studied them this week. Verse 25, therefore each of you must put off falsehood and speak truthfully to his neighbor, for we are all members of one body. Put off falsehood and speak truthfully. You know, falsehood is like a cloak that, they, that we wear to conceal things, okay? It's a veneer with which we mislead people and seek to secure an advantage. Now, it may not be a direct lie. Do you know what I'm talking about? When you're having a conversation with somebody... And you're not lying, but you're shaping what you say. You're wanting to give a particular impression. And your goal is to kind of get a little bit of an advantage. Not, you're not being bad, but you're also very intentional with what you're presenting. Now, I'm not suggesting that you say whatever comes to mind in the spirit of truthfulness, right? You ever met someone like that? You know, that whatever they think comes out and it's not necessarily helpful. Recently, we were sharing stories with friends. One of their children indicated who his parents were in a crowd with this flattering description. So they're in a crowd, and they said, who's your daddy? Who are you here with? And he said, oh, my dad's the bald guy over there. And then, who's your mommy? And, and, and the wife was pregnant at the time. Oh, she's the fat lady over there. And isn't that the way kids are? You know, whatever they're thinking just comes out. So I'm not suggesting that, because then you'll have some consequences. With our children, this is how we coach them. We say three things. We say, is it true? Because you can't tell a lie. Right? Is it helpful? Uh -oh. With the kids, it's like, you know, pointing out your brother's or sister's flaws, that's not helpful. And then third, is it necessary? So is it true? Is it helpful? And is it necessary? So what I am suggesting is, though I may not choose to reveal everything I think or know, right? We don't always do that. But I have nothing to hide. So he's saying, put off falsehood. Speak truthfully. I'm not necessarily going to tell you everything that's in my head or everything that I know. It may not be helpful. It may not be necessary. But I've got nothing to hide, right? I'm for you. I'm not looking to position myself to get an advantage. And in this world, when it feels like resources are scarce, it's tempting to do that, isn't it, in our jobs? It's tempting to kind of turn the dial a little bit, you know, frame the situation a certain way to convince that client or to convince that supervisor to see things your way. It's tempting, but God says put off falsehood and speak truthfully. You know, your parents didn't always tell you everything they knew, right? They had to consider the same things I mentioned above. 
You know, what about the first time you ask them where babies come from? <laughs> Enough said, right? They managed what they said. Now, they didn't want to lie to you. And you knew that you could trust them and that if they felt something would benefit you, they would tell you in an age-appropriate way. So let's speak truthfully. And put off falsehood. You know, let's really look out for each other. And that's what the first article of clothing that I believe that God wants us to wear. Because it's who we are. You know, we're his children. We're his kids. He wants us to reflect him well for his sake and for ours as well. He also says we're members of one body. You know, what would it benefit you know, you or me to hurt each other, to hurt members of our own body. We care about each other. You and I need each other. Verse 26, the second article. In your anger, do not sin. Do not let the sun go down while you are still angry. So he says, in your anger, don't sin, but don't let the sun go down while you're angry. So what's the lesson here? You know, it took me a while to figure this one out. You know, similar to fear, anger produces one of two things, either rash action or inaction, right? It says, I'm going to deal with this. I'm going to respond to you. I'm going to get it off my chest. Or inaction, which just says, I'm just going to let it go. I'm going to stuff it, and I'm going to let it stew until it kind of blows up. So he's, he's recommending something different. You know, if we react in the moment, we're left to manage the, the external consequences, right? We blow up and kind of let it fly and say what's on our mind, then we can create a mess that we have to manage and deal with, right? But if we just let it go and let it stuff and, and let it stew, then we're going to have to manage the internal consequences. You know, bitterness, and it starts to take root, starts to affect us, makes us feel unwell because we're so upset. So what is he recommending here? I believe that God is asking us to choose the proactive response, not rash and impulsive, but measured and intentional. But resist the urge, you know, to, to accuse or assign motives. When, when you're upset, say, you know, when you did this, I felt this. But oftentimes the offense is unintentional, right? The person did, wasn't trying to upset you. They just come across wrong. But if it's not an accident and that happens daily, right, in relationships, then this is a much healthier way to deal with it. You know, what happens when you suffer a scratch, right? You get scratched. Has that ever happened to you? Anybody ever had a scratch? A little bump? Some of you are more clumsy than others. I'm probably one of you. So you get a scratch. You know what? Overreacting doesn't help, right? <laughs> My daughter does that. It's, it's a, everything's a big, you know, big deal. So re overreacting doesn't help, right? But doing nothing about it can put you in the hospital, Right? So this is what we're talking about here. We're talking about when there is anger, when there is upset. Here's a, here's a way that we address it. You know, her and I, get Gracie and I together. We say, when we are upset, when we're having a conflict, first you have to express it. You know, you can't just go on and pretend like nothing happened. Say, I'll say, I feel upset, or she'll say, I feel upset, and then we'll take a break. Time out. We time out. But the most important part is that you set a time, you make an appointment revisit. You know, maybe it's this evening, maybe it's tomorrow evening if it was kind of a big friction. But acknowledge it, right? Say, I am, a, I feel upset. You're not, you're not accusing, you're not blaming. Don't do that. Wait till you're calm. But you are accepting, you're just acknowledging it. I'm upset. You know, let's take a break and then let's reconvene. So the second article is, in your anger, be proactive. Now this is a tough one, Right? We want to fight or flight, right? I'm going to, I'm going to let you know what I think, give you peace in my mind, or I'm just going to keep the peace, whatever it takes, right? So in your anger, be proactive. Verse 27. Do not give the devil a foothold, because you know what? That's all he needs. You know, the second law of thermodynamics also applies to relationships. How many family relationships or friendships deteriorate because they go untended. Can you imagine? Isn't that so sad? People who feel undervalued or taken for granted one day decide to withdraw. And neither party feels responsible. So neither party moves to close the gap. You ever experienced this in your life? I have. And yet in my limited experience, even the iciest of impasses can fall quicker than expected. 
when somebody's willing to take the first step and humble themselves and close the gap. You know, aggressive can burn bridges, right? When you're just going to close the gap, you're going to be aggressive, you're going to deal with it, you're going to express yourself. But I'll tell you what, passivity punishes you every time. I mean, the longer you wait, the long the gap grows. And then one day, it's going to feel like it's too late. So let's trust God and not give the enemy a foothold because the enemy loves division. He loves prolonging your pain. He loves to isolate you and make you vulnerable. So let's not give in to that. Let's not give the devil a foothold. Verse 28. He who has been stealing must steal no longer, but must work doing something useful with his own hands that he may have something to share with those in need. Now on the service, I feel like I can sidestep this one. You know, I'm not, I'm not out robbing people, you know, if somebody broke in last night, it wasn't me. Now, I'm not doing that. But the underlying heart attitude represented by the behavior of the thief is inescapable. You know, his desire is to get without giving. To take without investing. And let's be honest, in our society today, it's easy to fall into that. huh? Limited resources, limited time. i gotta, I got to take for myself and make sure that mine will be taken care of. But God's calling us to something different. I read an interesting book recently on what it means to be an artist. Now, who, who all would consider themselves an artist in here? See, I, I knew the response would be like that because I, I feel the same way. Oh, Angelique, oh, great. So we've got some artists in here. But, you know, the truth is, in his definition of an artist is someone who feels compelled to give a gift. Just somebody who feels a desire to give a gift. And the goal is not compensation. The goal is contribution. So by that definition, I begin to feel like I'm an artist. I don't, I'm not going to change my hairstyle and my clothing and, and begin living differently. But I have a desire to give a gift too. And, and each one of us has been gifted, designed by God. He's made you in a specific way so that you can give a specific contribution. So he's calling you to give a gift. You know, I believe that part of our calling is to be a group of artists, passionate about getting our unique gift to the world. You know, is this a struggle for you as it is for me? But if we're going to go against the flow and say goodbye to self, this article of clothing is crucial. Be a giver, not the taker, right? The thief is the taker, but we need to be a giver. Be an artist who paints a picture of Christ with your generosity and that unique way that God's made you to give your so that's the third article of clothing, is give your gift to the world. If it's to sing, sing. If it's to talk like I do, talk. If it's to hug, hug. If it's to cook, amen. You know, cook. Whatever it is how God's made you, give your gift to the world. Because we'll all be better for it. Verse 29. Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. Now, this is, this is a challenge for me sometimes. I like to have fun and kid around. If you've been around me at all, you know that. But our talk needs to be intentional, helpful for building others up according to their needs, beneficial to those who listen. This is where the economy of words is important. You know, recently I heard it was a famous speech. I looked up John F. Kennedy's inauguration speech. Now how long it lasted? 15 minutes. Very, very short. But every word was carefully chosen. Every word was delivered with conviction. That it was his famous, you know, ask not what, you can, what your country can do for you. Ask what you can do for your country. And it's one of the most famous speeches ever delivered. But it was short. It was concise. You know, Proverbs also has a lot to say about wordiness. Proverbs 10, 19 says it pretty bluntly. It says, too much talk leads to sin. Be sensible and keep your mouth shut. You know, the truth is, we want to be very wise with our words. because, And I'll tell you why. You know, nothing builds our credibility faster or better than our actions. Nothing builds our credibility better than our actions, but nothing destroys you're in my credibility faster than our words. So, number four is speak on purpose. 
Everything that you say, everything that comes out of your mouth, let it be edifying. Let it be for the benefit of those who hear. And I, and I know in the heat of the moment, it's tough. And I, and I regret some of the things that I say. But God's calling us to live in a way that reflects who we already are. You know, before, like these folks in the futility of their thinking and their darkened understanding separate from God, they didn't even have this choice. This wasn't even an option, these articles of clothing were describing. So let's speak on purpose. Verse 30. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God with whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. You know, many of you think about departed loved ones as you go on about your daily lives, right? Think about them. Maybe you talk to them. You know, my wife's uncle Jack visits Aunt Faye's grave a couple times a week just to tell her what's going on with the family. But have you considered, you know, that God lives inside you and inside me? He is aware of every thought, every word, every deed. So let's be mindful and considerate of our cohabitant. You know, when I think about my flaws, I think the Holy Spirit and I make kind of an odd couple. But I'll tell you what, I'm very grateful for my roommate. You know, in a sense, he's, he's like my roommate. And that's what God's saying here. He's saying, don't grieve the Spirit. Let's be sensitive to the presence of God in us. And let Him lead us and guide us as we seek to put on this new wardrobe. Verses 31 and 32, finally. Get rid of all bitterness, rage, and anger, brawling and slander, along with every form of malice. Be kind and compassionate to one another. Forgiving each other, just as in Christ God forgives. So he says, discard the old self. You know, that, uh, that old wardrobe, you know, that, that the one that makes you want to, you know, manage your words and, and be untruthful, the one that wants you to take and not, and not give, the one that wants you to deny the way that God's made you and making your contribution, the one that wants you to be careless with your words and just let it fly because it doesn't matter anyway. He's saying, get rid of that old thing, you know. Don't give it fish, but just throw it in the trash, you know. Let's get rid of it. Let's discard that old identity, and put on the new. Be kind and compassionate, forgiving one another as Christ forgave you. So fifthly, forgive as Christ forgave you. As we've talked about before, if you're still struggling to let it go and forbear and forgive, then just because of Jesus, let's choose to forgive. So have you put on your new self this morning? First of all, did you even know it was available? Huh? Maybe you just thought that you had to go on being the same old you. When you got saved. But God's given us a new identity. He's given us a new wardrobe. So have you put on your new self? Do you put off falsehood and speak truthfully? Is it tough for you, you know, to, to be kicked, to want to manage what you say and kind of gain the upper hand? Or are you being that person that when somebody's in your presence, they know this person's for me. They're not trying to get anything from me. I mean, that, that's, that's what we're used to, right? Out in our daily lives. Somebody's trying to get an angle on us. Somebody's trying to sell us something. Somebody's trying to turn the tables on me. So I've got to be on my guard. But God's calling us to live a different way. So do you put off falsehood and speak truthfully? When you're angry, are you able to be proactive? Are you the fighter? Yeah. I'm going to give you a piece of my mind, or are you the fleer? You know, I just, I just don't want conflict. Well, let's choose the proactive response. Do you give your gift to the world, you know, the way that God's made you? Are, are you making that contribution? Are you investing in other people? Are you doing what you've been called to do? Do you speak on purpose, right? Are you honoring this idea of economy of words? And do you forgive as Christ forgave you? You know, what if inspired by the new identity and the new wardrobe we've been given access to, we would dress in a way that would reflect well on our Heavenly Father. You know, think of the incredible fashion show we could put on that would help to market the exclusive line of our Savior. You know, what are you wearing? Sometimes, I know, man, we don't do this. You know, I don't, I don't ask Jack who his favorite designer is. But, you know, what are you wearing? I'm wearing Jesus. And it's on sale. Right? Just sweeten the deal a little bit. It's on sale. It's been provided. And if we choose to put on this new self, we can together avoid the indulgence trap and learn to really live in the way that God's called us. Pray with me.
God, thank you for today. And I pray that as we just consider, God, all that you've done on our behalf. God, you've been so good and gracious and kind to us. Not only have you saved us, not only have you given us a new identity, God, but you've given us a set of behaviors that were not previously available to us. God, we just didn't have the ability. We didn't have the Holy Spirit residing in us. But now, God, we have that opportunity to live lives worth living, to live lives of generosity, to live lives of measured speech, to live lives where we can engage and invest and serve and be who we already are in Christ. And God, we just cry out to you and beg you that you would help us as your children to understand you, to understand who we are, how you've made us, God, so that we can make that special contribution that you've designed us to make, that we can live with open hands, God, that everything we receive, that we're willing to give it back to you. And that, God, we're focused on blessing others with our words, not trying to control or gain an advantage on each other through our words. God, we love you, and we need your guidance and leadership every day in our lives so that we don't just muck things up. But we're so grateful for all that you've provided and the opportunities that you've provided us, God, to live a satisfying and peaceful life. And it's all because of Jesus. It's in his name I pray. Amen.